Hello. This DVD is part of MSHA's program, Voice in the Workplace, Minors, Rights and Responsibilities. The segment you are about to see dramatize different issues that may arise relating to your rights and responsibilities under the Mine Act. This DVD is intended to supplement the minors' rights education and training conducted at your mine. When Congress passed the Mine Act, they intended for you, the miner, to take an active, responsible role in helping to keep your mine safe. They believe that if you and your fellow miners took advantage of the rights expressed in the Mine Act, you could play a big part in helping to reduce workplace fatalities, injuries, and illnesses. It is important for you to understand that you have both rights and responsibilities as part of this process. It is your choice as to how you address issues such as those portrayed on this DVD or other situations at your mind. As you watch the DVD, remember that it's not just about personality conflicts, clashing egos, or your own likes and dislikes. There are requirements to be met and procedures to be followed. Although it is the operator's responsibility to ensure safe and healthful working conditions, a good safety program depends on the active participation, interest, and commitment of everyone at the work site. Should you, as a minor, representative of minors or job applicant have general or specific questions about your rights and responsibilities under the Mine Act, contact your nearest MSHA office for assistance. James Lilly is a shuttle car operator who's been working at the mine for two years. He's recently grown very concerned about what he believes to be unsafe and unhealthy work practices on the section. A continuous miner scrubber system is apparently not working properly, resulting in large amounts of dust in the face area. James is aware that coal dust and excessive methane gas buildup are dangerous without proper ventilation. We talked about it at work last night, but... James, you keep worrying about this. I just don't understand why you don't call MSHA and report it, especially if you think it's too dangerous. I don't want to do that yet. But every time I tram up to the face to load, I can see dust in the whole face area. Well, why does it do that? Well, the continuous miner has a scrubber system that works directly with the face ventilation system to control dust. If the scrubber system or the ventilation system isn't right, the dust just rolls back over the miner operator and I get a big healthy dose of it when I come up in the shuttle car to load. Plus, that dust can be explosive. James, you have to report this. What if something happens and... I know, I know. But I can't just go tell the boss how to do his job. I've talked to him about it before and he hasn't said anything. I realize the man's busy and we have to run coal, but... Well, why don't you and some of the guys go fix it? I wish I could. But for one thing, I haven't been trained on how to take air readings and that kind of stuff. And besides, when I'm in the shuttle car, I don't have time to check and see if a, a line curtain is hung right or to measure airflow. Well, why don't you call someone who will do something about it? Before I go making calls, I'll get with some of the guys tomorrow and we'll go talk to the boss. We should probably see the safety director, too. I just don't want to cause trouble or get fired. I know you don't like to make waves, James, but they like you. You work hard. I don't think you're going to get fired over this. I really believe that you're doing the right thing by speaking up. I hope so. As a miner, you play a vital role in safety at your operation. Remember, it is your life and your health, so take the opportunity to get involved. A mine safety and health program is only as effective as the hazard awareness it instills in everyone. Audrey Lilly has made an appointment with Diane Price at the local MSHA office to get some answers to her and her husband's safety concerns. Diane will listen to Audrey's concerns and then explain how the Mine Act affords minors certain rights to engage in safety and health related activities, including the right to file a discrimination complaint. Audrey, 
Audrey? Yes. I'm Diane. We spoke on the phone. Come on back to my office. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Sure, no problem. When we spoke on the phone yesterday, you said you had some questions about health and safety issues at the mine where your husband works. Is that right? Yeah, sort of. But I don't want to cause any trouble for him. But I am concerned about his safety. I understand. There have been some things going on at work. Some things that maybe he should talk to Emsha about. But he's kind of worried about saying anything because he doesn't want to cause trouble or lose his job. He does have a right to report hazards. Miners or their representatives can report hazards or even request an inspection if they feel that there are safety dangers or health concerns. We refer to those as hazard complaints. So he can request an inspection if he feels there's a safety concern? You see, he's not a supervisor. He's just a regular miner. That doesn't matter. He can report what he believes to be a hazard. MSHA has an 800 number, a national hotline that anyone can call to report accidents or health and safety hazards. You can file a hazard complaint about this issue right now if you wanted to, or you can go to the MSHA website and file a hazard complaint without even making a phone call. Hazards can also be reported directly to any MSHA inspector or any MSHA office. And you don't have to give your name on the report, right? That's right. Even if you do give your name and number, MSHA will protect the identity of anyone reporting a hazard or filing a complaint or anyone named in the complaint. Those are confidential matters. Let's say a miner, miner's rep, section foreman, or anyone has a private conversation with MSHA regarding hazards. Those conversations are kept confidential. Just like our conversation today, MSHA will keep this conversation confidential too. But see, Here's what worries me. He's already mentioned the problem to his supervisor, and nothing was done about it. We encourage minors to make an honest, good-faith effort to let management know about any health or safety concerns. This should be the fastest way of getting those problems corrected. It's always good when management responds quickly to resolve those types of problems. I know, but he says that he's heard about guys losing their jobs for talking to MSHA. And he's scared that if he talks to Emsha now, since he already brought it up, that the company's going to know that he's the one that complained about it. I would hope they wouldn't do that. Reporting hazards is a right, and therefore a protected activity under the Mine Act. Protected activity? When Congress passed the Mine Act, they intended for miners to take an active role in helping to keep mines safe and to speak up when they had safety or health concerns. They wanted to make sure that miners were protected from any sort of retaliation or discrimination when speaking out on matters of health and safety. That's why reporting hazards is an activity protected by the Mine Act, or what we commonly refer to as a protected activity. Okay, so what happens if he does report it? And then they might make life hard for him on the job, or try to figure out a way to get rid of him. I understand your concern, and that's exactly the type of retaliation or harassment that the Mine Act protects minors from. Now, I don't know all the details of his situation, but I can tell you this. The company is not supposed to retaliate against him for reporting hazards to management at the mine or talking to MSHA about health and safety. If they do, your husband could file a discrimination complaint. That's a different type of complaint, but it is also a protected activity. However, there's a big difference between the two. When MSHA notifies an operator about a discrimination complaint, the person who alleges the discrimination will be named in that complaint. It's not anonymous like reporting hazards. The company will even receive a written copy of the actual discrimination complaint. Okay, that is different. How does that work? Let's say he believes he was discriminated against in some way for reporting hazards or talking to MSHA and he decides to file a discrimination complaint. First, he must file the complaint within 60 days of when the alleged discrimination took place. If he was not aware of the discrimination within the 60-day period or other factors prevented him from filing his complaint, then his delay may be excused if he had a good reason. And remember, it's important to include details when filing a complaint. What kind of details? For example, it's a good idea to take notes or keep a diary or journal of what happened. 
document things like names, dates, places, times, events, and actions relating to the discrimination. Documentation is essential if the discrimination has affected you financially. If your husband expresses concerns at work about possible hazards, he should, whenever possible, express those concerns in front of people who could possibly serve as witnesses if needed. You can find out more about discrimination and complaints in this Guide to Minors' Rights and Responsibilities. MSHA will thoroughly investigate the complaint to determine if there is, in fact, substantial evidence to conclude he was discriminated against. We will notify him in writing within 90 days of our decision. Okay, so what happens then? There are a lot of possibilities here, depending on what we find in our investigation. If he is discharged, MSHA could request that he be reinstated to his old job, if that is what he wishes. He could also receive back pay, be transferred, or we may request other actions to correct the discrimination. Now, if we cannot find substantial proof to conclude there was discrimination, we would notify him and give him specific details on how to file an appeal of our decision and pursue the complaint on his own. Wow, this sounds complicated. We regard discrimination as a very serious offense and we investigate complaints thoroughly. We want to make sure that minors are not retaliated against for exercising those rights I told you about. Okay, I have one more question. If he had to file, could he file the discrimination complaint here? Sure, he could file it at any MSHA office or any Black Lung office. Well, thank you. I feel a whole lot better knowing that he has some options and that he is protected. Okay then, here's some more information about minors' rights that you can take with you. I will even give you a copy of the complaint forms so you will see what kind of information he will need to provide. Talk it over with your husband. I think it will help you understand the process a little better. And please give me a call if you have any more questions. Or have your husband call me. I'll be glad to go over this with him too. We definitely will. Thanks so much for your time. You've been so very helpful and I really do appreciate it. The Mine Act protects the right of minors and their representatives to voice their safety and health concerns without fear of retaliation. Whether you're a general laborer, equipment operator, safety director, foreman, or a contractor working for the mine, the Mine Act protects you. It is important that you know your rights and responsibilities. For example, it is prohibited for a miner to be fired, transferred to a lower paying job, lose job benefits, or be harassed in any way for reporting a hazard or filing a complaint under the Mine Act. While you have rights under the Mine Act, you also have responsibilities, such as assisting the operator to achieve safe work conditions, reporting all health and safety hazards, not making false statements and false representation. Remember, if you have health or safety concerns at your mine, speak up. Although it is the operator's responsibility to ensure safe and healthful working conditions, a good safety program depends on the active participation interest and commitment of everyone at the work site. John is an experienced miner of 20 years. John has worked at various jobs at surface mines. He's been at this mine for 12 years. At this job, he drives a haul truck He's also a skilled mechanic who performs maintenance on various types of equipment. John is a good employee and is not afraid to speak up. Mike, the boss, tells John that he needs him to run a front end loader for the following week due to personnel changes. Mike approaches John who is doing some maintenance on a piece of equipment. How's it going, John? What do you say, Mike? I'm just changing this cylinder again. This is the second one. Yeah, well listen, I'm gonna need you running the big loader next week because Ronnie is gonna be training the new hire down at the crusher. No, I ain't gonna run that loader. 
What do you mean you're not going to run it? I don't have anybody else. What, do you have concerns? No. I just don't want to run a loader next week. <sighs> Let's take a look at miners' rights and responsibilities here. Does it sound like John has a good reason to refuse to operate the front end loader? I don't think so. As a miner, you have a right under the Mine Act to refuse to work in any condition that you believe is dangerous to your health and safety. But remember, your refusal must be based upon a reasonable, good faith belief that the work really does involve a hazard or potential danger. You cannot refuse to do work based on your dislike of a particular job. This type of refusal is not a protected activity under the Mine Act. Hey John, how's it going? What do you say, Mike? I'm just changing this cylinder again. This is the second one. Huh. Well, listen, I need you to run a big loader next week because Ronnie's going to be training a new hire down at the crusher. No, I ain't going to run that loader. What do you mean you're not going to do it? I don't have anybody else. Well, you, you got concerns? Yeah, I'm afraid of that thing. You afraid to run a loader? No, I ain't afraid to run no loader. But the back brakes are bad on that loader. Come on, it ain't gonna run away on you. Hey, listen, the brakes are bad on that loader. I haven't been task trained on that loader or anything else that big. Now, Mike, I'm telling you no, that- No, John, I'm telling you. You're gonna be on that loader next week. I need you to do it. I don't have anybody else. We got trucks to fill. Now, you're gonna get on there and you're gonna practice a little bit and you'll get used to it. And then we're going to get your task training done later when we have the time. No, that right there ain't right. <laughs> you know what, John? You're, you're going to be all right. Don't you worry about this. Now, I need you to be on that loader. I'll see you tomorrow. I ain't running that loader. Yeah, you are. So, does this sound like John has a good reason for refusing to operate the loader this time? Absolutely. He has voiced his concerns about the loader's brakes and the fact that he has not been task trained to operate this piece of equipment. John's refusal to operate the loader under these circumstances would be a legitimate protected activity under the Mine Act. Management's responsibilities here are to address the miner's safety concerns and to ensure that he receives proper task training. Let's try this one more time. Hey, John, how's it going? Uh, how you doing, Mike? Uh, changing this cylinder again. This is the second one. Uh, well, listen, I need you to run the big loader next week because Ronnie is going to be training the new hire down at the crusher. No, I ain't going to run that loader. What do you mean, John? I don't have anybody else. I need you to do it. What, you have concerns? Yeah, I'm afraid of that thing. You afraid to run a loader? No. I'm not scared to run the loader, but that thing has brake problems on it. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Hey, is the big loader in service? Uh, no, the brakes need to be fixed. All right, well, Jeff, let's get it done. And uh, I don't want to see anybody on it. Is that clear? Gotcha. We got uh, parts coming in today, and I'm pretty sure it'll be done by tonight. All right, thank you, Jeff. John, I want you guys to let me know things like this so we can take care of the problems. I never, ever want to see you guys operate equipment that's not safe. I want you to speak up. It let me know. Well, Mike, I haven't run that loader, and I haven't been task trained on it. Wait a second. You didn't get task trained when everybody else did? Nope, not on that one. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Well, here's what we're going to do. First of all, after we get those brakes fixed, I'd like for you to get with Jeff and do a pre-op on it, okay? Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, we'll get you task trained Thursday and Friday, okay? And then you can get on it, run a little bit, see what you think. And, uh, you know, I'd like you to run it, but if you're comfortable with it. Well, that's fine. You know, if, if I get task trained on mm -hmm. it, 
I get a chance to get familiar with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know? Okay. All right. I'll feel better about it. Okay. Those brakes got to be fixed. Well, and I agree, absolutely. And they're going to be before you, Ronnie, or anybody else runs it. Okay? Okay. Hey, John, let me tell you something. You know, I know we get real busy, and, and you don't hear us a lot, but uh, you do a great job, and, uh, and you always like to do it right, and I want you to know I appreciate that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. So this is the second one you've changed. Man, second time I turn around, this is not here. I don't know. As a miner, you have a right under the Mine Act to refuse to work in any condition that you believe is dangerous to your health and safety. Your refusal must be based upon a reasonable, good faith belief that the work really does involve a hazard or potential danger. If asked to do work that you believe is dangerous to your health or safety, or if you're asked to do a job which you have not been trained to do, make a reasonable attempt to voice your safety concerns to management. Remember, if you have health or safety concerns at your mind, speak up. Although it is the operator's responsibility to ensure safe and healthful working conditions, a good safety program depends on the active participation, interest, and commitment of everyone at the work site. Jason Stewart is a newly hired miner at a surface metal, non-metal operation. He's worked there for two weeks and is up to date on his required training. Tim Reynolds, the miner's representative, has taken Jason under his wing, something he does with all new hires. Tim has worked with the company for over two decades and has been a miner's representative for 10 years. He's well respected by everyone at the mine with a reputation for being a fair-minded, safe, and by-the-book employee. How are you guys doing this morning? Hey, good morning. Is he teaching you anything, Jason? Yeah, I'm learning a lot. He's catching on pretty fast, too. How are you doing today, Bill? Yeah, I could be better than him, Inspector, here today. Guess I'll be traveling around with him. Hey, I want to go with you. Remember last time I didn't get to? It's all right with me, but we'll have to clear that with Frank. I'll give Frank a call and let him know I'm going to go. All right, what about Jason? Uh, Frank wants him to work at the Crusher this week. Okay, uh, can you meet me back here at the office say, in about 20 minutes? Okay, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> Grab your stuff. I'll give you a ride down to the Crusher before I meet Bill here. Do you always get to travel along with the inspector? Not always, but if I'm here and one shows up, you can bet I'll let management know I intend to travel with them. That's part of my responsibilities as a miner's rep. Well, how do you get to be a miner's rep anyway? Well, the Mine Act says any two or more miners can independently choose someone to represent them. Uh-huh. Well, when I came here, I'd been working at a, another mine several years, and I served as a miner's rep. Uh, a bunch of the guys came and asked me to represent them, and I agreed to. <laughs> Is that all it takes to be a miner's rep? Well, that's part of it. Uh, then the necessary paperwork has to be filed with the district manager for MSHA. Uh, it gives the name of the miners who chose the rep, mine ID, addresses, and so on. You have to make sure the district manager knows that the rep was chosen according to the rules. It's more to it than I thought. Yeah, it's not so much. Well, so why do you like to go along with the inspector? See, it's my job as a mine rep to be the eyes and ears of every miner here. So I travel with the inspector and point out any problem areas, uh, any health or safety issues that have been raised, answer questions. You talk to the inspector? <laughs> sure, I talk to the inspector. Let them know what's really going on. As a rep, I also take part in the inspection conferences, right along with management. Does Frank ever get mad at you for getting involved like that? <laughs> I've worked here for a long time, and Frank's been mad at me plenty of times, believe me. We go back a long ways. Look, the bottom line is that the Mine Act wants miners to be involved with safety. They want the company to do the right thing, too. It's a two-way street with rights and responsibilities on both sides. I hear you. Let's get going. The Mine Act gives certain rights to a representative of miners, a person chosen by two or more miners to represent them in safety and health matters at their operation. Congress wanted to provide an opportunity for miners, their representatives, 
and representatives of the operator to accompany inspectors during the physical inspection of a mine. They also wanted all parties to be able to participate in pre- and post-inspection conferences held at the mine. This activity is protected under the Mine Act because Congress felt that you, with your knowledge of the worksite, could provide inspectors with a great deal of useful information. They also felt that if you watched what happened during an inspection, you would better understand how the Mine Act's safety and health requirements work. I'll get back of the crusher to ding. How'd everything go yesterday with the uh, inspector and all? Pretty good. We covered a lot of ground. You know, I've always been curious what an inspector does. Let me ask you something. Do you get paid when you travel around with the inspector? Sure do. We can take part in inspections and conferences, but the company only has to pay one of us to participate. Uh, that is if there's only one inspector. What happens if two or three inspectors show up? Well, that's a little different. Say more than one inspector shows up, you know, just check out different parts of the mine site. Then we have the right to ask for someone to travel along with each inspector. Oh, do they still get paid too? Uh-huh. They don't lose any pay. But I want you to understand, this is an important thing. It's not about getting paid to follow an inspector around. The important thing is making our workplace safe every day. That sounds good to me. Uh-huh. Oh, it's got to be Frank. Okay, yep, it, he's, uh, he's on his way up. Well, I guess it's that time. See you later, Jason. I'll see you. Your representative has the right to accompany MSHA inspectors during their activities that involve enforcement of health and safety standards. If employed at the mine, the representative also has the right to receive their regular pay when they participate in inspection activities. If a miner's representative is not actually employed at the mine, they still have the right to accompany the inspector. However, they are not entitled to pay. If there is no representative at your mine, or if a representative is not available, the inspector will consult with a reasonable number of miners about health and safety matters. In certain circumstances, there can be more than one miner's representative. For example, should the inspector decide that more people need to participate in the inspection, they may allow the operator and the miners to have an equal number of additional representatives. Remember, if you have health or safety concerns at your mine, speak up. Although it is the operator's responsibility to ensure safe and healthful working conditions, a good safety program depends on the active participation, interest, and commitment of everyone at the worksite. Gerald Keener has applied for a job as a dozer operator at a mine located in a small rural community. He has all the certifications and a good work record. He also has a very good safety record and is well known for his attention to making sure the equipment is maintained properly and safe to operate. He's always been straightforward about speaking up if there were problems with the equipment. Looks like most of your dozer experience is on the D10 and 11R. That's good. We use them here. Ever run them on stockpiles? Yes, sir. I've run them on stockpiles, uh, run, uh, run them out around the loadout. Work around tunnels and draw holes? Yes, sir. you got to watch out for them getting bridged over. Bad in the wintertime. Thank goodness I never backed a dozer down a draw hole before. You got that right. I've seen it happen. We reinforced the cabs and all of our dozers here. You know that special glass with the steel on the backside? Right. Now, Gerald, round here, uh, keep a dozer pretty busy. Uh, developing drill bench, uh, taking care of overburden, cleaning up the shop, reclamation, uh, haul roads. <laughs> you name it, we push it. Uh, mm. You think you'd be okay with all that? Sure. I've, uh, I've done a bit of reclaim and road work before. Uh, even worked on some drill benches. Uh, I can run a small cat, uh, a loader, a scraper, a grater. That's real good. So I see you've got your certification, latest copy of the 5023 training seems to be up to speed. Looks good. Tell you what, it's, uh, it's almost lunchtime. Uh, 
why don't you go grab yourself something to eat and uh, come back here around uh, 12.30, if that's all right with you. All right. I'd uh, like to have you uh, do a pre-op on a Cat D10 or 11R, either one. Uh, probably have you run a bit, too. Now, that's company policy, something we have all our applicants do. I understand. Okay. Just come on back to my office about 12.30. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Hey, Gerald. What are you doing over here? How you doing, Greg? I'm over here applying for that uh, dozer job. Really? Mm -hmm. I thought they already hired somebody. Well, I hope not. He, he told me to come back after lunch, do pre-op on a D10. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He does that with anybody looking for a dozer job. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, I'll see you. All right. Hey, Mike, uh, here's that purchase order you wanted. Oh, good. Thanks, Greg. Hey, did uh, Gerald Keener apply for that dozer job? Yeah. You know him? Sure do. Uh, worked with him a few years ago before I took this job. Seems like it might work out. Uh, I'm going to have him do a pre-op on a D10 after lunch, see what he can do. Uh, just talking to him, I think he'll be all right. Mm, I don't know about that. What do you mean? Oh, he's a pretty good operator. But just between us, I think he might be a lot of trouble. I don't know if I would hire him if I were you. Why not? Well, when I worked with him, it was always things like brakes weren't right, mirror had a little crack, too much dust, always hollering for the water truck, just little things. I think he called Emsha a few times about the uh, dust. He claimed he didn't call, but it was always funny. He fussed about it, and then two days later, an inspector shows up. He jumped right off the dozer, started talking to him. Hmm. Sure seemed like a pretty good guy to me. Seemed to know what he was talking about. Oh, sure, he can run a dozer. But I think he'd be calling Emja over every little thing. <laughs> I ain't afraid of Emja being here. I mean, we're always going to have to see Emja one way or another. And I don't care to take any piece of equipment out of service, especially if it's going to get someone hurt. You know me, Greg. Well, whatever. I was just letting you know that if you do hire him, don't be surprised if he starts bleaking about things. Appreciate it, Greg. Oh, before I forget, uh, when are those new batteries you ordered going to get in? All right, I'm on it. I'm on it. Supervisors have to make tough decisions sometimes. It sounds like Greg has just made Mike's hiring decision a little more difficult. So what do you think is going on here? Personality issues for sure. But Mike, the supervisor making the hiring decision, must come to his own conclusions about whether Gerald would be a good employee based on qualifications and experience, not hearsay. Mike also knows what the Mine Act says about discriminating against an applicant for work at a mine, regardless of personality issues, or in this case, what Gerald may have said or done. And let's take this one step further. What if Gerald did, in fact, make complaints about what he believed to be unsafe or unhealthy working conditions? Reporting hazards is a protected activity under the Mine Act. Mine operators know that refusing to hire someone based simply on the fact they engaged in a protected activity is a violation of the Mine Act. They may face legal actions and penalties for such discrimination. The Mine Act protects the rights of miners and their representatives to voice their safety and health concerns without fear of retaliation. Whether you're a general laborer, equipment operator, safety director, foreman, contractor working for the mine, or in this case, an applicant for employment, the Mine Act protects you. For the past year, mine foreman George Turner has made it clear to all his section foremen that this year's production goals set by the corporate office must be met. He has very little tolerance for halting production. Brad Sears has been a section foreman at the mine for about a year. It's the end of the day shift. Earlier, Brad shut down the belt for an hour and a half so that his crew could remove a guard and safely clean up spillage around the belt drive. When Brad made the decision to shut down the belt, he anticipated that 
he would probably have to explain fully why he stopped production on the section. George has summoned Brad to the mine office for an explanation. Yes, of course I understand that. I am going to take care of it. That's right, we are going to talk about that right now. Okay, goodbye. That was corporate. I am looking at the daily production report and I do not like what I see. Brad, it says here that you shut down belt number three for over an hour. That is a big time problem, I guarantee you. Well, George, we had to remove the guard to clean up around the tailpiece. And there's no way I was going to have my guys do that with the belt running. That's just way too dangerous. So you shut down the belt for over an hour and a half. It had to be done. It would only take 15 minutes to clean that stuff up if someone would just pick up a shovel and keep it quiet. Yeah, but if you don't take the guard off and do it right, it just piles right back up again in no time. That's what the maintenance shift is supposed to take care of. You could keep it clean enough long enough to get us to the second shift. Well, that's the problem. They've had guys out for the past couple of weeks. They, they haven't been able to keep up with it. You are the foreman. We pay you a supervisor's salary. You do not need to shut down everything over every little thing. If, if you keep doing this, they're going to get rid of all of us. We're all going to be looking for a job, okay? Especially with our numbers down the way they are. Now, this is the second time something like this has happened. If we have to have this discussion again, you got to listen to me. This is going to stop right now, you understand? If we have this discussion again, then some people are going to be fired. Now, Brad, I want you to think about some things. I'm going to take you off that section. I want you to go walk the air course. I want you to check the seals, all right? And I want you to think about whether or not you want to be a foreman or not. That's all. Brad, I heard that. I think he needs to switch to decaf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there was nothing I could do. If I made them clean under the belt drive while it was running, someone could get hurt. Brad, listen, you did the right thing shutting down that belt. I, I'd rather it be shut down and no one get hurt than to have an inspector do it for us. Now, you're doing a fine job, and you will remain on that section. I guarantee that. George is under pressure. We all are. But we're not going to have safety take a back seat. George was letting off steam, but that's no excuse for the way he talked to you, and I'm going to deal with this right away. Now, don't you worry about this. You just keep doing a fine job, and I'll see you tomorrow. Blowing off steam, I'll say. It looks like the pressure is starting to get to George. I guess we can sympathize with him to some extent. However, let's look a little more closely to see what's really happening here. Do you think George's problems will be solved if he threatens to fire his people? Production pressure is constant, but it's no excuse for taking shortcuts, because shortcuts can lead to property damage, lost production, injuries, or even fatalities. What about Brad? He did the right thing for safety. Remember when we discussed protected activities? This applies to supervisors as well, because they are considered to be minors. As a supervisor, you may not be fired, demoted, harassed, intimidated, transferred, refused employment, suffer any loss of wages, or be discriminated against for exercising your rights under the Mine Act. By interfering with Brad's rights to engage in a protected activity that is related to health and safety, George has taken what is known as adverse action against Brad. George took him off the section as punishment to give him time to think about it, a clear violation of the Mine Act. Not only has George left himself open to a possible discrimination case, it also looks like he may be in violation of Section 110 of the Mine Act for knowingly violating mandatory health and safety standards. He could be subject to civil penalties, fines, and imprisonment. Not to mention, he's probably violating company policy, too. As a miner, you play a vital role in safety at your operation. As a supervisor, you, too, are a miner. The Mine Act protects you as well. 
Remember, it is your life and your health, so take the opportunity to get involved. A mind safety and health program is only as effective as the hazard awareness it instills in everyone.